Hey everybody, Gavin Syme here. Ansel Adams taught us that great images begin in the mind's eye. And today we're going to talk about using our mind to make our images better. We're going to take a look at five images today, and we're going to take a look at five ways that we can use our mind to make our images better right now. I'm going to start today with five pictorial images. And we're going to keep it simple. I kept it to all pictorial images for consistency, but here's the thing. Every one of these is either won a merit or a loan collection award at the International Photographic Competition. So these are all award-winning images that we're going to look at today to give us kind of some consistency and some perspective. And while these are pictorials, everything we're going to look at applies to any genre. We're talking about the principles of visualizing, seen in the mind's eye, and craftsmanship in image making. So I do portraits, I do different types of things, and all these principles apply. We're going to talk about light, tones, space, detail, and lines today. And methods that we can apply those to make our work better right now. Let's start with Sunset at the Celestial City taking at the Grosvenor Arch in Grand Staircase National Monument in Utah. This is a panoramic piece, and it has a great deal of detail. And let me just show you the source raw images that it was made from. So the light is key. And when I talk about the light, I'm talking about not only the light in the real world we're dealing with, or the light that we're making with strobes or fill lights or whatever it is we're doing, the light on the subject, not the light we're going to add later. The light in here was phenomenal. And you can see in the finished image that yes, there's some post-production involved, there's some stitching, all that kind of stuff, but I didn't have to do a lot to this image. I had to control tones and things like that. And we'll talk about that as we go forward. The light, if it's right, is irreplaceable. And this is a common problem I see all the time, whether it's portraits or whether it's landscapes or people at a national park, and they're moving around at all hours of the day and they're making images and click, 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 clicking away, but the volume of images does not equate to the quality of images. When I'm making photographs, I'm looking for that one really stunning piece. And so I might go all day looking around and enjoying the sights and making some snapshots and some reference images, but what I'm waiting for is the right light on the right subject. And there's times when I've come back year after year after year to wait for the right light, the right sky, the right conditions. Here as the sun is setting low, we have the arch here, we have this whole segment of rock kind of isolated, a simple composition, but a nice wide panoramic scene. It's like a castle structure here almost. And it's accented, all this great detail, by the light. A lot of resolution in this. I'm a wall portrait guy. So the master original print on this, we're looking at doing probably 100 inches or so on canvas with this. And we're going to have phenomenal detail in a very, very high resolution image. In this case, this is about 11,000 pixels wide. And so we have the arch, and then we have all the supporting cast, and we have depth and detail and dimension. If it was midday, everything would be kind of stark and evenly lit. Here we have this rich light tickling the edges of things and giving us the beauty that we need in this scene. The light is everything, and you can't fake it. You can use artificial light, you can use natural light. There's different means of approaching it, but you have to get the light right if you really want to make it sing. It's not something that you fix in post-production. It's a common problem photographers had, have. Light is our medium, and yet it often seems that we're fundamentally terrified of light. We need to be comfortable with light, we need to learn to see light, really see it, before we make the image. Let's move on, and all of these are going to connect together. Here is Midnight Seattle. This went loan collection at international competition. And this is an HDR done from three images that were bracketed, and then they were merged together. Now, I don't have a thing about HDR. I teach HDR. I teach tone. We talk about a lot of this kind of stuff in workshops like Exposed, like HDR Magic, and some of the videos that I put out in the past, the collections. And HDR is, is high dynamic range. It really is about light. So we're talking about light, but on this one, we're going to look at the tones. What oftentimes happens in a complex or a busy scene or a scene with a lot of flat light or even light, like sometimes happens with an HDR, is we lose ourselves because there's too much information. Now here's the process. This is the original process out of probably Photomatics is what I did this in. And an HDR 
is just high dynamic range. You don't need to have three images. You don't need to follow a certain protocol. What we're focusing on here today is not the fact that this is an HDR image, but the tones themselves. Now this looks pretty good. And a lot of times you'd see an image like this taken and just put straight out. But thinking about the tones, what do we want to do with an image? How do we want to carry it through is key. I've got a good composition. I had neat light. I had some neat clouds. I made good exposures and I got a good high dynamic range image. But look, there's some distractions down here in the reds. The light is a little bit flat throughout. Now compare this to the finished image and look at the subtle differences because there's a lot of them. I spent a lot of time on this image doing things as subtle as burning down the side of one building and lightening up just a little bit the side of the other, lightening the highlights or burning and dodging, the kind of stuff we used to would have done in the dark room. And controlling the tones, obviously the subject here is the space needle. A great image has a subject, usually just one. If you have more than one, there's probably a problem. If you can identify your subject and use your tones to draw the eye to that subject, use the light in the real world, to give you the right direction, the right mood, and the right feel, and then use the way you expose and bring out the tones in the image all the way through to post-production to get the subject to absolutely sing. If you do that, combining your light with the way you use tones, everything changes. Let's keep moving on here because we don't have a lot of time. I want to look at Sliver Moon Blues. Now, Let's talk about space. We've looked at light and we've looked at tones and we can see both of those being applicable in here. We have very bright highlights to dark shadows and yet not clipped, not completely black, not completely white. A lot of detail in this image, which was actually shot at ISO 3200 at 170 millimeters, presenting a lot of challenges. The moon was really low and this is actually not a full moon, it's a sliver moon. And you can see the sliver here and this made a very unique concept for an image because I was able to get the scene and the light the way I wanted without the moon completely washing out. And if you go down here, you can see in the reflection, here's the sliver, here's the light part of the moon, but I was able to retain a lot of detail on the moon because while it was visible, which was unusual, it actually was not a full moon. This spot right here is barren dust bowl mud hole desert in New Mexico. And if you were to see this in broad daylight, you would say, wow, that's, that's not a photograph. The light and the tones changed everything. And then to make this one really shine, to make it really sing, we use space. And we can go here real quickly to the original, or to the raw file rather, where we see a lot more noise, we see some detail work was done. And let's just take a look at what the crop was on the full frame. This was a vertical frame. And I'm just going to reset the crop real quick to the original and show you how that was. A lot of empty space on the bottom, empty space on the top. Let's go back to the final, thinking about our space once again. In the final image, we've definitely done tonal control. We've got rid of some of that noise, detail work, post-production work. But the key here that harkens back to what we did in camera was composing in such a way that I could go for this square crop. The more you see in the camera regarding space, the better you're going to come out in post-production. It's all happening in the mind, oftentimes before you ever press the shutter, sometimes after. We have a symmetry here that the eye kind of goes back and forth, and then it takes in all these nice lines and details, the rich colors, the kind of mirror image effect of this beautiful scene. The space is an incredibly powerful tool, and it harkens to things like space, position, line, and tone, uh, like, like masters such as Kim Whitmire teach, like we talk about in the photographics workshop. These elements, that happen in the mind change the way we make images. All right, then let's carry it on to detail. Now bear in mind, every one of these factors we're talking about should be going through our mind as we're planning every image. All of these characteristics are exhibited in these image. We're just picking out specifics so we can talk about details on an individual image. This one was sent to competition like this with the frame border. It was shot on four by five film. And if you look here and know your films, you'll see it was shot on Ektar 100, which is a color film and I then converted it to black and white in Lightroom. Now I love shooting traditional black and white film, don't get me wrong, but that factor here gave me control over the detail. 
Now, when I say detail, I'm talking about two things. This is a 4x5 scan at probably around 100 megapixels. There's an enormous amount of detail in this image, of textural detail, of detail in the foliage, of detail in the water down here with this somewhere around a four-second exposure. Okay, there's a lot of detail, and that detail is good. But in the larger sense, I'm talking about managing the detail. Sometimes managing detail means making sure you're on a tripod, making sure the image is going to be sharp when you go to print it. Sometimes it means moving a piece of trash out of the scene or having your subject step a little to the right or picking up the tripod and moving it six inches closer. Sometimes it means using your lights and your tones and your space in such a way that the focus is where you want it. But detail is critical, and you should always be thinking about it as you make the image. Forests are hard to shoot in, but they're not the only place that's hard. I like taking a forest scene like this because it really makes you think about the detail. We have the subject. The one subject, of course, is our nice, beautiful waterfall here. Uh, longer exposure, giving us that silky water, bringing in the look we want. But the tone and the values on this are key. Let's go to the original scan. Now you see how things are a lot lighter. It's beautiful, but the tones are a lot wider spread. There's a lot more lights up here in the trees. There's a lot more distractions, even though it's a great image and arguably your eye still goes to the subject. Now, the light was good. If I had waited till high sun on this, the specular highlights coming through these trees, as we often see in images in a forest, would have been terrible. In this scene, I could have done a portrait. I could have done a landscape like this. I actually have a similar image to this from this same area that was done in color. The light was soft. It was gentle. And even though the scene was complex, we could control the detail by using good light, which we had, good space and composition here to draw the eye in, and then controlling the detail, paying attention to our framing, paying attention to the way we finish the image and burn and dodge so that in the final image, we had a richness. And you can see I did quite a bit of burn and dodging to make sure the eye was drawn into this image and the other areas didn't become too much of a distraction. Ansel was a master of this. A lot of his work was done in the dark room refining the image. So all of the work in our mind doesn't have to come before we release the shutter. Some of it can come in post-production. But if we visualize and we think about the elements and the factors, if we use our heads throughout the process of making an image, we're going to end up with better images every time. The more I see an image in the mind's eye before I ever press the shutter, the more I think about, okay, I'm going to do this to it. When I'm planning an image like this, I think about my zone system like we talk about in Expose. I say, all right, I want my water to be at, let's say, zone 7. And I'm going to put the surrounding areas of the rocks down around zone 2 to zone 4. I think about these different tone values. And we can't get into all of that today. But I start placing tones. I actually start seeing the image in my mind before I ever press the shutter. That's visualization. Let's go to the fifth image in our series today. And let's talk about lines. We've looked at light. We've looked at tones, space, talked about details. And we're going to look here at lines. Every single one of these images merits and exhibits every factor that we've talked about today in varying ways. I've just chosen them in this order so we can analyze specific details. Once again here, we have beautiful light at the right time. It's evening. We ended up hiking back miles in the dark from the subway here in Zion in order to stay late enough to get the light shafting down through here. We have the tones the lights and the darks. We have the different color tones happening. We have space in terms of what is surrounding the frame, not making it too tight, having it cropped in such a way that your eye doesn't get distracted and lead out of the seam. We have detail management in that obviously the subject is this main subway here, but all these other contributing supporting cast factors lead the eye into that. And we have a ton of line here. We have line coming right through here with the pool of water. We have lines swinging up this way. We have Hogarth's lines kind of down through the, through the canyon. We have lines in the definition between the red rock and the blue up here because of the way the light is striking it. We even have specific details, and I'm going to go to the raw file once again. Not a lot of cropping done. I planned this a lot. I will set an image on a tripod. I will think about it. 
I will visualize. You see that I didn't do a lot of cropping because I was actually, when I made this image, and the video of this is in the Photographics Workshop, it's one of the images we made during Photographics, I was moving the tripod a little back and forth, inches at a time, to get this area right up here and determine where I wanted certain lines to intersect. I didn't want a gap here where sky was coming through. I wanted a specific intersection of lines in every area of the image so that the eye was led through and took in the light, the tones, the space, the details, and the lines in the way that I wanted to see to tell the story of the subject that I wanted to tell and at the same time show a lot of detail and a lot of information in the image. Now, everything I've talked about today is not necessarily the way you have to do it. Your style is going to be different. You might be doing a completely different type of work, and that's fine. The point is that if you understand the concepts of really analyzing, don't go around just click, click, clicking images. One of the things I do, and I learned a lot of this when I started doing 4x5, is I don't need a thousand images. I need one. I need to take my time and I need to slow down and I need to start seeing in the mind's eye. I need to start thinking about these concepts like the light, the tones, the space, the detail, the lines. And I need to start building that image in my mind as soon as I start planning it. Sometimes that means coming back later. Sometimes it means setting up lights or doing something different, maybe changing a strobe around in the case of a portrait. But it always means thinking because great images start in the mind and are finished hanging on the wall. I'm Gavin Syme, and that's all for today. Go out, use your craftsmanship, raise the bar, and make your images better. Take care.